This information session tonight, we will be discussing the online and part-time graduate programs in financial mathematics offered at the Whiting School of Engineering at Johns Hopkins University. My name is Cheryl Williams, and I am the Assistant Director of Recruitment and Marketing for the Whiting School of Engineering. With me tonight is Dr. David Audley. David is the chair of our online and part-time programs in financial mathematics. He also works as a senior lecturer in our Department of Applied Mathematics and Statistics, where he is the executive director of our full-time programs in math financial mathematics. He has published extensively in the areas of financial mathematics, term structure models, fixed income derivatives, and quantitative portfolio strategies. He teaches a number of courses for our programs, including financial engineering and structured products. David, would you like to say hello? Yes, hello everybody. Glad you can be here. Thank you, David. For tonight's presentation, we'll start off with an introduction to Johns Hopkins Engineering. Next, David will discuss with you our online and part-time degree programs in financial mathematics. Then we'll review some helpful information on tuition and payment options, talk about next steps and important dates, and we'll live end with a live question and answer session. If you have any questions at any point in the presentation, please type them into the questions tab on your control panel. If you are joining us via a cell phone or a tablet this evening, simply select the question mark to access the question section. We'll address all questions at the end of the presentation. So why study engineering at Johns Hopkins University? Johns Hopkins University was founded in 1876 as the nation's first research university. The School of Engineering opened its doors in 1913, and in 1915, it began offering part-time engineering coursework as night classes for technical workers. Since then, we've grown to offer more than 20 programs that can be completed part-time. 18 of these programs can be completed entirely online. Our programs are designed by people who thoroughly understand your industry. Our faculty are all expert and working engineers and technical professionals. And our faculty and instructional designers construct new and update existing coursework every year so it includes the most up-to-date information. In addition to our part-time programs, the Whiting School of Engineering has over 25 research centers and institutes. This includes our strong partnership with the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory in Laurel, Maryland. We also offer full-time bachelor's, master's, and PhD programs that are conducted in residence at our Homewood campus in Baltimore, Maryland. Our online and part-time programs are led by respected senior engineers from our Applied Physics Laboratory and faculty from our full-time programs. We are ranked in the top 20 best online graduate engineering programs by US News and World Report. And of all the schools that are included in these rankings, we actually have the largest online part-time student population. So not only will you have lots of fellow students going through a similar learning experience, but these rankings really speak to the quality of our programs, regardless of our size, and our school is experienced and well-equipped to help you navigate graduate education as an online student. The degree that you earn studying with us part-time is of the same quality as our full-time degree programs. Your diploma will not say online or part-time. You are eligible and highly encouraged to participate in commencement and as a graduate, you will be one of more than 28,000 Whiting School alumni and will join our esteemed international alumni community. So that is a brief overview of who we are and the value of our programs. Now David is going to talk to you more about financial mathematics. David? Good, thank you very much, Cheryl. So um, I think there's a couple of things that I always like to emphasize to um, people who are interested in our program. And, um, of course, um, I like to um, mention our on-campus program because the, um, the online program uh, is as similar to the full-time program as we can possibly make it um, at the same time having students participate um, asynchronously online. Uh, our on-campus program is a top 10 program in financial mathematics. Um, and 
uh, I should say that our on-campus program is uh, entirely contained within the Department of Applied Mathematics and Statistics, though our full-time resident students uh, often take courses in other um, departments in the university, including such as computer science, uh, economics, um, pure mathematics, and, and others. <clears throat> so it's, it's, um, it, it's natural that we can say that our curriculum uh, is rigorous. Uh, it, it is extracted from uh, a program encapsul encapsulated within the Applied Math and Statistics Department. And uh, the courses that we offer online and are part of our master's program are exactly the same courses that we offer on campus. Um, in the courses that I teach in both on campus and online, I use the same um, PowerPoint presentation, I tell the same bad jokes, and um, everything is as identical as possible. Uh, for a couple, for a few of our courses, um, we have experimented with uh, video capture, where um, the uh, videos that you get to um, use as um, teaching aids online are in fact um, a combination of the PowerPoint slides as well as um, uh, classroom uh, participation. You get to see me, uh, I will mark on the uh, whiteboard, but then most of these uh, uh, annotations are also included on the PowerPoint slide. So it's, um, it's in my estimation, as close to the real deal that we give to our students on campus as possible. So faculty with applied expertise. So I spent 20 years on Wall Street uh, before coming to Johns Hopkins. I got my PhD from Johns Hopkins many years ago. I worked on Wall Street. I worked uh, on both the buy and sell side as it's referred to. I worked at uh, Merrill Lynch and at um, uh, uh, Bank of America, since Merrill Lynch was taken over by Bank of America. I've worked at uh, asset management firms. I worked at three different hedge funds uh, over my time uh, in the industry, one being the hedge fund of Julian Robertson, uh, the Tiger Fund. Um, I think that uh, to some extent, um, and also other faculty that are in the um, financial math online program uh, also uh, invariably have PhDs, that's a, a standard that we keep, and uh, are very involved uh, in the industry. Uh, one of the faculty members, Peter Lin, um, is a, uh, taught for a few years at, uh, at Stevens after uh, finishing his degree at Johns Hopkins and is now the um, managing director of a hedge fund that he started. Um, and so he has, and, and plus he has a uh, computer science master's degree from Columbia. So that's uh, another element within our um, faculty, um, um, faculty that are involved with the program. Um, so the teaching methods. Uh, in the on-campus on program, um, we have lectures. Uh, we also have uh, uh, opportunities for students to engage with uh, faculty. Uh, in the online program, we have, the again, the same lectures, uh, but we have some additional things that I, th that I think are extremely valuable to students who uh, participate in the program. Of course, there is a, um, what we call office hours uh, sessions during the week where students can uh, engage with me uh, in, a, in a group setting. Uh, I also um, typically engage with students one-on-one -on -one when uh, that's pre preferred by them. Uh, but we also have a discussion um, mechanism in our program whereby students uh, are engaged in certain discussion questions and engage with each other. Um, and I find this to be something that we have in the online program 
which is even better in a sense than what we have on campus because within our program probably two-thirds of the students are already employed in the industry and they bring many different um, perspectives uh, in the areas of asset management, risk management, uh, treasury operations, um, um, you know, co uh, computer specialists who work on trading desks at, at the broker dealers. And um, in the context of these discussions, their insights are just um, extremely valuable. So that's the, um, uh, so we'll go on to the next slide. I think I've covered everything um, that we have there. <clears throat> Oops, wrong way. So we have uh, within the financial math uh, program uh, in the uh, engineering for professionals uh, component of the Whiting School, we have a master's of science degree in financial math. And we also have three graduate certificates in uh, financial risk management, in quantitative portfolio management, and in securitization. Uh, the master's degree, as we'll um, talk in a moment, is a 10-course uh, um, requirement to uh, complete that degree. And these graduate certificates uh, use courses within the uh, master's program as uh, requirements to get the certificate after completing five of those courses. And some of our students find this to be um, a very good way to kind of leg into the program, feel as though they get um, some uh, credential along the way and then can continue to complete the, master, the Master's of Science degree. Um, again, uh, the master's program is a 10 course um, requirement. There are nine core courses and one elective, and these courses need to be completed in five years. The certificate is a five program, is a four, five course program, where um, the courses must be completed in three years. Now, I should say about the uh, master's degree, uh, we've had students um, um, apply to have variations in the nine core uh, course uh, component and uh, because maybe they want to take a course in um, uh, some uh, computing technique um, that that would be very rele relevant and applicable. Uh, so we, ha we do um, entertain uh, variations in the structure of the program. And so the, um, the courses that we uh, require, an introductory course uh, in investment science. Um, we use the uh, David Lewinberger uh, textbook by the same uh, name, investment science, for either the investment science course that is offered within the 555 department, which is the financial math. And then there is an identical course uh, taught out of the 625 Department of Applied Applied and Computational Math, and they're both called Investment Science. So whoever it gives our it gives students an opportunity to start, um, you know, at a point uh, of their choosing, and not necessarily in the fall spring uh, cycle that might otherwise be um, uh, that otherwise might be appropriate. Um, then there's a two course sequence in. Um, Financial in financial derivatives is an introductory course, and then there's a course in interest rate and credit derivatives. Uh, these two courses um, I teach on campus out of the uh, John Hull textbook uh, with some additional material, especially as it relates to interest rate and credit derivatives. Um, we have a financial risk management course. Um, a statistical methods course which incorporates uh, data analysis and this is a course for which um, there's a fair amount of uh, computation uh, in included. There's a course called optimization in finance, uh, a Monte Carlo um, course, a course in methods for Monte Carlo analysis, a uh, course in time series analysis and dynamic modeling, 
and then the course in stochastic differential equations. Um, if you look at the course uh, distribution, you'll see that there are courses that are um, more uh, applied courses to finance, and then there are other courses that are uh, deeper in applied mathematics, such as in statistics and Monte Carlo methods. Uh, and and certainly the stochastic differential equations course. Um, we do this because we feel as though practitioners in the industry and graduates of our program should have a, a, a strong foundation in the mathematics that underlie many of the uh, techniques that are being used in the industry and on Wall Street, whether it's for quantitative trading or optimizing investment portfolios or structuring um, uh, transactions, um, you know, for particular um, corporations. Um, because the industry changes, uh, probably like no other, as I'm sure you're aware, the changes that have come on since uh, the credit crisis uh, almost 10 years ago now. Uh, many changes in the industry, there are changes that are driven by uh, new accounting standards, there are changes driven by regulation and by uh, various practices within the industry. So it's, uh, it's important for people to have the analytic um, background, the quantitative background, as well as an insight into the computational techniques uh, that are associated with that. Uh, we have a couple of electives currently um, on the books. One in the quantitative portfolio theory area, and again, this is quantitative portfolio theory and performance analysis. Uh, as I tell students, um, if you're a portfolio manager, you want to know how your performance is going to be analyzed so you can better uh, optimize the strategies that you're using to meet your client uh, requirements. So that's uh, two aspects of kind of two sides of the same coin. And then there's a, uh, a course in uh, what we call financial engineering. It's a course in securitization. Think mortgage-backed securities and various asset-backed securities and securitization of all kinds of uh, collateral that we see in the industry today. So that's, the, um, that's a little bit about the, uh, com uh, the items within the program. Yeah, so I've, I've looked ahead a little bit. Um, in the certificate, we have the... Um, in the certificate area, we have the financial risk management, and these are the courses that are part of that. Uh, much of financial risk management today involves um, computing various um, uh, measures of exposure that portfolio managers or banks or other financial institutions might have. And to a large extent, uh, Monte Carlo analysis is uh, very key to that as are the statistical techniques. And um, along with the uh, various asset classes, um, there is the element of financial derivatives. That's an important uh, adjunct to uh, the risk management uh, question. The next certificate is on quantitative portfolio management. This is one that is um, <clears throat> near and dear to me. Um, again, there are the introductory courses in the various uh, asset groups and their derivatives. Uh, but again, the required course here is the portfolio and performance analysis course. And the, uh, the key element within uh, quantitative portfolio theory is optimization. That's uh, uh, highly uh, incorporated within many of the quantitative te techniques today. And, and of course, data analysis, big data, and all of that is 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 part of that um, of the portfolio of things that a practitioner in this area needs to know. Is in securitization. Uh, I myself worked in securitization. Uh, I started out on Wall Street in a structuring group at a uh, Wall Street firm at the time. It it no longer exists, but it was known as Prudential Securities. It was part of the Prudential Insurance Company. Um, and again, here, uh, the first two courses are the same uh, as the other certificates, but um, we have the securitization course, the statistical methods course, the big data, the uh, especially as it relates to um, 
modeling collateral for various transactions. And again, the Monte Carlo approach to analyzing um, many of these uh, structures are, are what we call path dependent. And so Monte Carlo is a very important technique for analyzing them. So admission requirements. Um, uh, candidates should have a bachelor's degree in a quantitative discipline. Um, for example, engineering discipline, uh, mathematics, uh, some of the um, financial economics programs are very quantitative. Um, and where uh, we, we encourage applicants who may not have the, f the full uh, quantitative uh, credential that we look for to uh, get in touch with us and, and let us uh, talk about what experience they have uh, and what courses they may have taken beyond the bachelor's degree uh, that's separate from the formal education that they may have had. Um, candidates should have two years of full-time work experience uh, in finance or a related field. This could be in uh, in computing or um, you know within the treasurer's office at a bank or at a corporation or you know almost any financial related uh, discipline um, sometimes we, uh, we we allow students with less than two years like they may have been are applying a year and a half after their bachelor's um, yeah so but the guideline is typically we like um, two and a half years of, of work experience. Uh, the quantitative uh, undergraduate degree um, is mainly um, structured to try and ensure that candidates have the mathematical background that will help them succeed uh, in this program. And, and that, that includes a calculus, linear algebra, uh, some differential equations, it could be a course in linear algebra and dis differential equations. Uh, certainly probability and statistics. Uh, probability, um, we like for people to have some experience with continuous state probability, which some people refer to as calculus-based probability. So in calculating probabilities, maybe uh, one would have to solve an, or phrase um, a relationship through an integral uh, and some computer program is very helpful as well. We do not require the GRE and every uh, candidate who applies is looked at on the merits of their individual application. These requirements that we show here are guidelines. If you meet these requirements, there's no, there's no need for any further discussion. If there are some um, uh, shortcomings, uh, we're certainly happy to, to look into that uh, with you and see what kind of remediation would be appropriate for you so that uh, you can be fully admitted to the degree program or the certificates. Right, so all of our um, uh, coursework and everything within our program is online. Uh, I mentioned that we have um, some video capture, which is kind of like the virtual live that uh, exists in some other programs. Um, and that gives the, um, that gives students who participate online the benefit of questions that may be asked in class. Uh, they may be the same kind of questions that uh, occur to you. And, um, and so that's, uh, that's a very useful, um, that's a very useful uh, structure. Thank you, David. Uh, now we'd like to share some information to help you take this next step. Some of the most common questions that our admissions team gets from prospective students is what is the tuition and what resources are available to help me pay? So here it is. Our tuition is $4,250 per course. Our courses are each three credits. So this is the total tuition cost for each three credit course. Because our tuition fluctuates every year due to inflation, we encourage students to budget $45,000 total for their degree. Uh, this cost may exclude books and materials. The cost of books and materials differs uh, depending on the coursework that you register for. But 
In addition to tuition, uh, our students do not pay any fees. So we do not charge any annual or semesterly technology fees. Uh, our online and part-time students do not pay, for example, any student union fee. Uh, we do not charge an application fee for our online and part-time students. So no fee to submit your application for admissions. The only fee that our online and part-time students pay is a fee at the end of their course of study with us known as a graduate's fee. You have a variety of financing options available to you depending on your personal circumstance. I really encourage you to investigate and to take advantage of any education benefits that your employer may offer. We unfortunately do not have any scholarships available for our online and part-time graduate students but there are other associations and organizations that do. For example, the National Consortium for Graduate Degrees for Minorities in Engineering, otherwise known as the National GEM Consortium, uh, does offer fellowship programs. Rules, requirements, and application instructions can be found on GEM's website. The application for these fellowship programs is open from July 1st to November the 13th. So just keep those dates in mind. If you are a U.S. citizen or a qualifying U.S. resident, you may be eligible to use financial aid. The financial aid that's available for graduate students is largely unsubsidized loans, so similar to that, you can, of course, finance your education through a personal loan. And if you are active duty or retired military and you have veterans benefits, you can, of course, utilize these to finance your education. We do have a number of active duty and retired military enrolled in our online and part-time programs. If you are planning to use veterans benefits to finance your education, here are some things to keep in mind. The URL that you see here on your screen, ep.jhu.edu backslash veterans, has some great information on the forms you need to complete and submit in order to utilize veterans benefits at Johns Hopkins. For Chapter 33 post 9-11 benefit recipients, the Department of Veterans Affairs sets an annual cap on tuition for private schools. That cap is $23,671.94, and that is for an, an entire academic school year. So it includes the fall, spring, and summer semesters, and then it renews every fall. Five courses will come in under that tuition cap. The cost for five courses is $21,250. The cost of five courses, however, will exceed the tuition cap. The cost of five courses is $25,500. Johns Hopkins is a Yellow Ribbon school. How Yellow Ribbon works at Johns Hopkins is that it is applied once that tuition cap is exceeded. And if it is exceeded, qualifying students can receive up to $1,000 per year. It's awarded on a first come first serve basis. Coming this fall, there are some changes regarding how the VA will be calculating the housing allowance for Chapter 33 recipients. Basic housing allowance, BAH, will be calculated using the zip code for on-site classes, i.e. the physical location of the classroom utilized. We are also happy to announce that Hopkins offers various networking opportunities for our veteran students. For current students, there is an online networking group available via LinkedIn. Simply search the Johns Hopkins University Veterans Connection Group or Johns Hopkins Veterans to locate that group on LinkedIn. We also have uh, a networking group for alumni offered through our Alumni Affinity Office. You can visit alumni.jhu.edu to learn more information on that group. Students who are educated outside of the U.S. do have some additional admissions requirements. They are that they must submit an international credit evaluation of any credit earned at non-U.S. institutions. We prefer that they go through WES. Uh, that's a third-party credit evaluation company. Um, and for these students, the, the product that you want to request from WES is called the ICAP. These students will also have to provide proof of English proficiency via, for example, qualifying scores on a TOEFL exam. Unfortunately, international students studying on an F1 student visa are not eligible to enroll in this program. Um, typically, international students are permitted to enroll in our programs and study online from their home country. Uh, you know, the what is required to maintain an F1 student visa is uh, 
a form called the I-20, and it confirms that the student is taking on-site courses with the university. Um, so, you know, indeed studying it in the country at that university. Um, the coursework for this program is offered entirely online. Um, so we cannot issue the form I-20 for, for students studying this program. But like I said before, if you, if you are an international student uh, and you are interested in studying our programs, you are more than welcome to uh, enroll in our programs and study online from your home country. Next steps and important dates. If you're interested in studying with us, your next step is to submit your application for admissions. You can do that by visiting ep.jhu.edu backslash apply. And then you'll need to submit your academic transcripts and your professional resume. Uh, instructions on where to send these additional documents can actually be found on the application website. Uh, it is in the text above the application form. We offer rolling admissions for our online and part-time programs. Uh, typically, it takes four to six weeks from the time that we receive a student's completed application package, so their online application, their professional resume, their academic transcripts, four to six weeks to review all of those documents and then issue that applicant a decision letter. So with that timeline in mind, here are some important dates. Fall registration opens on July the 5th, which is next week, and the fall semester begins on August the 27th. So right around the corner, if you are interested in studying with us in the fall, please submit your application as soon as possible. Um, for the spring semester, we there is lots of time uh, available for you to submit your application materials. Uh, registration for the spring begins on October the 25th, and the spring semester begins on January the 28th. So that is the end of the prepared portion of our presentation. Now I'd like to open it back up uh, to all of you to have David answer your questions. Uh, just as a quick reminder for anyone who uh, joined us after we began our presentation, if you would like to ask David a question or, or myself a question, uh, simply select the question section on your control panel and you can type us a question. We'll read it on the air and, and answer it live. Uh, alternatively, if you are joining us via a cell phone or a tablet, uh, simply select the question mark to access the question section. And again, just type that in and we'll answer it for you. David, are you ready for your first question? Yes, I am. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I uh, should, I, I would like to just, uh, so I'll answer a question that hasn't been asked yet. Uh, and sure, probably would be asked. But we uh, currently in the financial math program, we have two students that are actually on active duty uh, in the military. One is a, um, a member of the Coast Guard. Oh, and wow. he um, he actually um, does his coursework and participation on board ship, um, which I find very interesting. Uh, that's so wonderful. We, we do have that. Yep. Oh, so that's questions. Great. All right. The, this question right here, is there a formal application process for these certificate programs? Um, or is it open enrollment? Uh, so, so I could I could start the answer to this question. Yes, students wishing to enroll in the uh, the certificate programs, you do have to apply uh, formally uh, using the methods that I just discussed, submitting your online application and then your academic transcripts and your professional resume, uh, and the uh, kind of Additional questions to tack on to this question. Do the math prereqs also apply for the certificate programs? David. The short answer is yes. Um, but we are, again, um, happy to work with. So th there are some of the courses that, w that the uh, math prerequisites are um, absolutely vital for. Uh, and other of the courses, um, you know, a lower level of math um, uh, preparation would probably be satisfactory. Again, we don't we don't make these prereqs uh, arbitrary. We do it so that students uh, don't have to do a whole lot of scrambling at the beginning of a course because you know the course immediately dives into some 
uh, uh, some material, some statistical technique or another. Um, but yes, we uh, we consider again, as I said, uh, we have to, we have admission requirements, but we again consider every applicant individually. And and I should say that at this time of the year, um, I I and the admissions committee are on a daily basis respond to the uh, completed applications that get forwarded to us. We don't we don't sit on them for weeks you know, waiting for some uh, solemn meeting. We, 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 we address them um, on a day-by-day -day basis. As soon as they come in and they're complete and they get forwarded to us, we review them, we respond, and we get the results back to you uh, quickly. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, this next question, uh, which is a great question, uh, are there any advisory services or career fairs um, that the college are, <clears throat> offers for from local employers where a potential candidate can learn more about what types of jobs are local, um, what they can expect to earn as starting salaries, et cetera. Um, so David, I'm happy to share some information regarding our uh, career center. Yes, um, please. Okay. All right. So, uh, yes, we, we do have a career center. Um, we, and we offer the career center offers, um, a number of career fairs and by a number, I know that they offer at least two, they offer, they may offer more. Um, the, but, and one of them is specifically, uh, for employers looking to, uh, hire, um, students coming from technical disciplines. So uh, kind of STEM, they, they do hold like a STEM related career fair annually in the fall. So uh, that is open to our online and part-time students as well. Uh, and they are encouraged to, to participate if they are, um, you know, searching searching for new career opportunities. Uh, the other thing that I'll say is that we have an online kind of career a portal called Handshake that we use. Um, we have a number of uh, companies who have asked us to post positions and share them with our students, and we share them through uh, basically a listing on on Handshake. And our online and part-time students do have access to that as well. In addition to those, uh, the career service the the career services department does hold a, a variety of webinars, online information sessions that are geared towards uh, working professionals. So even if you're not looking for new professional opportunities, they have offered uh, information sessions, um, you know, such as, you know, get topics like keeping your resume up to date, uh, networking within your own particular organization for advancement, um, things of that nature. So, uh, and we are constantly uh, partnering with them to kind of build out more services for our students. So, um, some available now, some in the works, lots of exciting things. Um, David, anything that you want to add? Yes, I would like to add um, a couple of things, uh, several things actually. First of all, um, on the employment front, the, um, the single most effective uh, job search uh, approach is through networking. Uh, I would say that uh, as we see with our on-campus students, uh, there are many, many, many jobs that are not uh, advertised through traditional means uh, that can be discovered uh, through networking. And um, the, the advantage that uh, our online um, participants have is with the um, other online participants who are already working in the industry. Um, you know, we have uh, uh, students who are at, you know, major firms, um, globally even, um, and th there are various discussion and chat sessions where they'll, they'll mention that, you know, my firm is looking for 
or I've heard that our firm is going to be having openings in a particular uh, area, risk management or whatever. So, um, in fact, that uh, that channel is so um, so rich that um, we are we are exploring um, combining that that um, resource uh, with our on-campus um, master's students. We have the master's program on campus is rather small. Uh, typically, uh, about 35 students come in each year. Um, and they are in the same situation of, um, you know, finding uh, finding careers, starting careers, and um, and it's the networking um, uh, is is a key thing. Um, we have a, a full time professional uh, within the applied math and statistics department that supports uh, the financial math program, and she makes available to students uh, all of the what I'll call grapevine that she that she hears and I would say she sends out two or three emails every week about openings about um, various events that um, students uh, need to be aware of um, for example I think on the 8th of July uh, there is a, um, a, a mixer I wouldn't really call it a job fair, but it's a mixer mainly with Hopkins alumni that will occur up in New York. Uh, it's called the Wall, the Summer Wall Street um, mixer or something. Um, so those those kinds of events are are made available to um, online students in the financial math program as well. Um, of course, the issue is if you're a student in California and there's something event going on in New York, it might be it might be a challenge, but at the same time, there are many, uh, many uh, things that are um, indicated uh, through these various sources. One last thing I would say about Handshake, I would say about a third of the jobs that our uh, resident students uh, finally wind up or even internships come as a result of engaging with Handshake. It's a very, very rich, powerful system uh, that engages uh, not only employers but alumni and which support the uh, the whole networking uh, activity. Okay, next question. All right, uh, next question. Is the entire master's degree offered online or is it just the certificate program that's offered online? The entire degree pro master's degree program is offered online. <clears throat> so all of our courses for the master's degree and the certificates are all offered online. We offer, we don't have any um, of the remote, we don't use any of the remote centers that other uh, graduate programs in the Whiting School might use. Ours is exclusively online. Wonderful. Next question, what programming languages are used? Uh, and the attendee uh, listed out some examples of, of programming languages, but uh, yeah, programming read those. languages used uh, SAS, R, Python, C++. Okay, Any so cer certainly uh, uh, R and and Python. Python is is has become of growing uh, utility in the uh, in the industry. Um, R is, of course, um, also very popular. Uh, SAS, um, we don't see that. Uh, some employers still use that um, quite extensively. Um, I would also say that, uh, as um, you know, you, you all might giggle, but probably the most popular programming environment on Wall Street is Excel, um, and and the adjuncts to Excel, such as uh, the um, the, you know the various um, uh, you know plugins and and programming environments such as the uh, Bloomberg Professional Workstation and its API and uh, and and things like that. So um, C++ it's 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 very important for um, people who want to work uh, in a, in a heavy programming kind of environment. Um, but and, and while many of our students do take uh, 
C++ and, and various object-oriented programming languages. Um, uh, I think that uh, there are many jobs that, that don't require that level of expertise. Um, I would say that the biggest thing that employers are looking for are um, prospective employees that can work with, with very um, varied and nasty looking data sets. I mean, this is the era of big data, whether it's from relational databases, time series databases, various, um, various forms of, um, of, of data repositories. Does that answer the, does that, does that work? If it doesn't, please ask a follow-up. Okay. Um, to that attendee, let us know if you have any follow-up additional questions related to programming languages. I think somebody else uh, had run, written in um, Visual Basic. Um, yes, Visual Basic certainly um, within the Excel environment is um, extensively used. <clears throat> Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, and let and let us know if you have any follow up questions related related to programming languages uh, used in this program. The I, I've been scanning the questions, uh, David, and it looks like we have a number of questions related to um, admissions requirements. Um, you know whether or not if if a candidate isn't um, doesn't match the perfectly the um, admissions requirements that we showed on the previous slide. Uh, for example, we have one attendee who has a bachelor's degree in engineering, but um, does not have experience in the financial sector, but has worked as a software engineer. Um, the we have uh, another uh, attendee who. Um, you know, is is uh, is you know is completing a, a program with Carrie, um, but is is interested at the the Cary School of Business, but is interested mm -hmm. uh, in our program as well. Um, does not have uh, the math, uh, some of the math that was listed on that slide. So for for candidates. That uh, and you know what, I'm happy to actually pull that slide back up while we discuss this. Um, for candidates that do not have um, all of the admissions requirements that we discussed, um, what would be your advice to them? So I would I would advise them uh, to. I mean, the, the application process is is not um, is is not especially uh, challenging for 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 people who would like to know more about their particular situation. It's very helpful for us to look at uh, transcripts for various, for whatever degree programs they've been involved in. Look, We look at your resume uh, to try and identify um, things that you might have done professionally that would, um, that would suit some of these, um, some of these requirements. I mean, I see, um, you know, people who may not have the formal training in statistics that have done projects in, in, in industry and, and feel like they may be um, sufficiently skilled uh, to handle, you know, the statistics competency that we ask for. Um, so it's always best to, uh, to submit your, uh, you know, your background. Um, the, often we will in, in reviewing um, an application, uh, we have various um, provisional and conditional acceptances where we might say, well, if you get, if you take this course and, and do well in it, usually I think we say a grade above C or something like that, um, then you'll be fully admitted. Um, so, um, and, and so that may not include taking a formal course in everything that's listed on this slide. That is three semesters of calculus, multivariate calculus, a course in linear algebra, a differential equations course, a probability course, a statistics course. No, um, there, there, may, there are various, especially people in engineering programs, often take hybrid courses in engineering mathematics. And if there's an indication 
of what might be in those courses, um, that can be very helpful to us in, uh, in making a, a determination for admissions. And again, the, 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 we're looking for uh, indications that you have the, the background, the quantitative background that will allow you to be successful in the program. We don't want, we don't want people to come in and, and be a quarter of the way through a course and all of a sudden get in, into you know, a very uh, difficult situation where uh, there's a lot of um, mathematical material that you know, is not familiar to them. Uh, often uh, people are, that are applying uh, you know, contact me uh, directly and may ask me, well, I have a community college nearby that offers this course. What do you think? And I'm happy to, uh, to you know, to work with candidates to, uh, you know, to say that yeah, if you do that course, that that's a good one. That'll that'll get you over the hurdle. Um, <clears throat> this is a great. Uh, we have a, related to that, we have an attendee with a similar question, um, which I think would be a good good time to kind of clarify some things. So if, if Students are uh, student need needs some maybe prerequisite coursework. Completing it at a community college is a good route. Um, we have one attendee that at, that asked whether or not um, you would accept a coursework completed through a MOOC, um, like a Coursera or an edX, to fill prerequisites. It, it depends on the context. In other words, uh, I've had um, applications from uh, a, maybe a student who never took math anything beyond accounting and, um, you know, and had really no calculus or anything on their uh, transcripts. Um, and unless, I mean, we, we, we like for some of the competency kind of validated by um, an entity that would issue a grade. It doesn't have to be exclusively that way, but that certainly adds to the credibility associated with any competency claim. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, <laughs> maybe the, uh, you know, this convert, this question comes up um, quite frequently in some of our presentations for our other programs, particularly the programs that um, that have specific prerequisite requirements. Um, and oftentimes we will say uh, no, that 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 the student, the, the, the applicant or or whoever to fulfill this requirement needs to take it with a regionally accredited institution. So. so what I uh, what I do and what I've experienced in several several cases recently even um, candidates have various you know work experience background and so forth and they're sure that you know they could do well in in validating those uh, those experiences and so in our 625 um, department that's applied in computational math there is a course number 201, mm -hmm. which I think is, um, I think it's called basic mathematics. Uh -huh. uh, it's, not, it's not so basic, but um, <laughs> I, recommend, I recommend to students that if they want to, in a very short order, uh, validate their competency, take that course. It covers a lot of things in probability, in statistics, and in linear algebra, and in some of the uh, the calculus realms, and it does so in one term. Uh, so it's uh, if if you feel as though you have that background, uh, this could be a course that you take. Uh, I've even uh, suggested to students that if they, for example, have been out of school for you know 10 or 15 years, to get the Shams outline series to review. A material that they may have had in the past and then take that course and if they do well I'm, I'm satisfied absolutely 
Um, and I believe that those 200 level courses, we actually, uh, the prerequisite courses that we offer through uh, our university, the tuition is not the same as the um, graduate coursework that you would take as part of the program. Um, isn't that correct? I think it's a reduced rate, like. I, th I think it is, but again, so that's a course that, for example, I'm familiar with, but if somebody wants to take an online course somewhere else, uh, mm -hmm. you know, please um, let us know and, um, you know, and provide us with, uh, you know, some of the descriptive material that they may uh, publish associated with that. And, um, and, and we'll consider those kinds of alternatives as well. I mean, many of the universities around America and, and even community colleges do some, offer courses like this for people who are, you know, who seek to bring their currency up to date in various uh, subject areas. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, all right. So this next question, um, the question is, is the program self-paced? Um, but I think that this gives us kind of the opportunity to um, maybe discuss a little bit more in depth how our online courses are conducted. So David. Okay. So um, students get to choose um, when they take courses. They have to take courses, 10 courses for the degree, five for the certificates. The uh, 10 courses have to be taken within a five-year window. The five courses for the certificate have to be taken within a three-year window. So you can choose if you want to take off a semester, take off summer. If you want to take two courses in one semester, that's that's your, your options. Um, commensurate with the offering schedule uh, that we have. And for the most part, we try to offer enough courses so that students can come and go and there's always something to, uh, uh, something to, uh, a course to take. Okay, so within the courses, however, um, the course usually runs over uh, 12 uh, weeks or 14 weeks, depending on uh, the time of year, the semester. And each week, uh, a module is assigned within the course, and students uh, have the flexibility to complete that module at their own pace, at their own time of their own choosing uh, during that week. Uh, usually, that's, uh, that's involved with uh, reading some material, watching the video lectures. Um, there's very often some... Uh, self-testing, self-evaluation that's available, uh, participating in the various discussion sessions, uh, attending um, uh, office hours uh, a, a requisite number of times over the semester. Um, and then there's usually a homework set that's due at the end of each module. Uh, these homework sets are typically um, constructed to take a couple of hours, um, you know, of looking, you know, reading the questions, maybe looking back at material, you know, developing solutions and then submitting them. So uh, it is, um, it is self-paced, um, but then each of the modules have to be completed uh, by the end of uh, the period for which the module is assigned. All right, wonderful. And did you, I, I am so sorry, I was flipping through some of our remaining questions. Did you mention that uh, uh, faculty hold uh, office hours once a week? Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, All right. We hold right. office hours once a week, sometimes more often. And again, uh, office hours are useful because uh, there's, there's participation um, and you get to hear other students asking questions and the responses and whatever discussion goes on associated with that. However, I would say that uh, very often students will email me uh, and even uh, ask to have a, uh, a call uh, to go over some item that, um, you know, they feel a one-on-one -on -one, um, uh, forum would be best. And, and I do that, and I think all of our faculty are amenable to that as well. All right, wonderful. Well, I want to be sensitive to the time. Um, the time is 8.05 p.m. Eastern. Um, so I think that this would be a good time to wrap up, David, if that's okay with you. Okay, We sure. do have a number of uh, questions uh, that have come in. 
A um, couple of questions regarding kind of uh, your opinions of specific courses and uh, other programs available at, uh, you know, uh, other universities. And I, um, would you be available to maybe answer some of these questions via email? Sure. Okay. Sure. And I think my email address is available. Um, usually, um, I respond to all of the students in a course very often the same day they ask the questions, but invariably within 24 hours. Um, the responses to these questions could take an extra day, but I would de I definitely promise to get around to them. Um, and David, if people do have uh, follow-up questions, how would you like uh, them to get these questions to you? Would you like them to email you directly, or should they email me and I can forward them to you? They can email me directly. I, I, I'm fine with that. Um, the other thing is uh, if they would like to have an interactive discussion, I'm certainly willing to uh, set aside some time to do that. And they should email me to ask that, ask for that if they'd like. Sure, sure. <laughs> what is your email address? So it's david.audley, A-U-D-L-E-Y, at J-H-U dot E-D-U. All right. Wonderful. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Um, so, so everyone, thank you so very much. I, as I said before, thank you for all of your great questions. Uh, David and I will follow up with you via email after this presentation. Um, I also want to let you know that we did record this evening's presentation, and once we have posted that online, I will send you the URL so that you have access to this material um, whenever you would like. Thank you again for your time this evening. David, thank you for your time um, and for answering, you know, for all this great information.